this is going to be a very uh, unusual talk for me. I normally don't give talks to, pe to people who don't work on similar topics. So I'll try to do my best to showcase the research that uh, we do in, in my laboratory um, in the Museum of Comparative Theology and also some of the interesting things, you know, some of them have to do with traveling around the world looking for the most beautiful creatures um, out there. So this is just a map, it's actually a, a little bit old, we could cover much more, but this is a few years ago I had to give one of these talks to some uh, high school kids and I was showing where we had projects at that time in the world. So our research is, is global in, in the sense that we have to go and look for the animals that we need to work on in many different parts of the world. And there's different reasons for that. One of them, as I will show, is biogeographical. We want to study the organisms that live in different continental land masses and how they've been changing as the continents have been reconfiguring. And other times we have to go to places where there's animals who only live in that particular place. So if you get unlucky, you might need to have to go to New Zealand to collect something that only lives in New Zealand. You know, it would be much easier if they live in our backyard here, but you know the winters are a bit tough. I tend to work on things that are a bit more tropical so they don't survive well here. So we work on invertebrates, and I know that most people are familiar with some invertebrates. I just want to tell you a little bit. This is a a pie chart of the total animal diversity. If you count all animals in the world, you'll see that most of them, in fact, about 96% of animals are invertebrates. The other minority, about 4%, are the vertebrates, things that you might be familiar with, like whales, T. rexes, or yourself. Okay? But most animals are invertebrates. And in fact, when we look at them from an evolutionary perspective, we can see here uh, a tree, an evolutionary tree that is trying to depict the relationships between those different animals and basically all the animal tree is invertebrates except for a very small insignificant branch here that includes us. Okay? But most of the important animals are invertebrates, the ones that have interesting morphologies, interesting biogeographical stories, and that's what I study. And, and in the lab we actually cover most of the diversity of this tree. We've had people who work on sponges or corals or all types of worms and all types of arthropods. And I'll show you some examples of the work that we do and why we do that type of work. One of the things that we do in the lab, and it was in the title of the talk, is biogeography. Biogeography, to me, is a very appealing branch of biology because it's really integrative. You have to incorporate information from evolution, from geology, from earth history, and you have to look at things with many perspectives in mind from ecology and other aspects. So this, you know, I will say that biogeography is the science that attempts to describe and explain the patterns in the distribution of life on earth. Okay? And we can do that from different perspectives. One is a historical perspective. That's the one that is going to explain you why there aren't polar bears in Antarctica, for example. I mean, ecologically, they could live there, but bears evolved in northern hemisphere. They never crossed the equator, and therefore they never go to Antarctica. Right? So that's the historical component. We're trying to understand some of those aspects. And there's an ecological component that I don't work on that as much. It's less evolutionary but it will be just also assessing whether the environment is amenable for some organisms to live there. Okay? So I'm gonna focus a little bit on some of the earth history aspects and some of the more historical components of biogeography, but I think that it has you know, these, these great properties of integrating a lot of different parts of biology, from ecology to evolution and other disciplines, especially earth history and you know, geology. One of the figures that uh, I'm trying to follow somehow is uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, you know, the first, the father of biogeography. Uh, he spent many years in his life navigating the Rio Negro in Brazil or you know, collecting birds and butterflies in Southeast Asia. He was a, a true 
zoologist at the time where he will just leave home and come back five years later, you know, full of specimens and things like that. And he was known, among other things, for proposing at the same time as Darwin, and in fact, it triggered Darwin to publish his Origin of the Species when he got a manuscript, a letter from Wallace saying that he had reached these conclusions from looking at this biodiversity around the world. Darwin had been working on that for many years, and uh, both of them presented an original paper in the Royal Society of London, uh, in the Linnean Society of London, sorry, where they actually um, announced you know, the, the origins of the, or evolution via natural selection. Um, he was a, an amazing uh, person. And the other, uh, so one of the aspects that at the time of Wallace and Darwin we didn't know are some new developments that happened during the 20th century mostly, and it's the theory of continental drift and the uh, expansion of plate tectonics. And continental drift is basically a theory that says that the, the crust of the earth is moving, you know, uh, and with that, you know, it's taking the continents and, and changing their configuration. And this is something that we'll see was proposed by a German meteorologist, uh, although he didn't have the mechanism to explain that uh, continental drift. And then the plate tectonics explains actually how that continental drift. So those two aspects were instrumental developments from geology, from study of deep uh, sediments in, in marine biology that actually allowed us to really understand evolution or bring it to a different level. This is uh, Alfred Wegener, and he proposed this idea. Everyone thought he was completely crazy, saying that the continents were not stable. They actually were moving, uh, and they were moving quite quickly, and that's how you, know, you could line up the map of South America with the map of Africa, for example. And those things had been separated, and actually he died in his last expedition when he went to Greenland, because he postulated that Greenland was the landmass that was moving at the fastest pace, he went to Greenland to, with some geological measure to take some geological measurements to prove his um, his theory of plate um, of continental drift. Um, but obviously, then later on, people started understanding continental drift and and understand that what we see as continents are only the emerged part of some plates. You know, these tectonic plates, and they're always in. And obviously, in the areas where we have those tectonic plates, you know, that's where you have all the natural disasters like, you know, volcanism and like earthquakes. So the reason why, you know, there's those big earthquakes in San Francisco is because you know, it's in the verge of two plates, and when that plate moves, it creates those earthquakes. And the reason why there's so many volcanoes and things like that in Southeast Asia is because they have this thing that is called the ring of fire, which is that two plates, super active, uh, and there's a lot of volcanism, there's a lot of uh, tectonic events. And now we're beginning to understand how these things actually happen. And once we see these plates, uh, we can understand that things, new crust is being formed all the time in the middle of the oceans. So you go to the middle of the Atlantic, there's the oceanic bridges, where actually the lava is coming out, or you know, and there's forming new, uh, it's adding new material to the crust, and as this lava emerges, you know, forms volcanoes, and then this is moving towards the continent, and then since it's heavier than the continental uh, place, then it just goes inside, in what we call, uh, you know, the lithosphere goes there in, in these oceanic plates, and, and that's, you know, that's a continuous movement that it continuously reshapes uh, all the continents. Okay? So nothing static, there's land being added all the time in the middle of the oceans. And in fact, when you look at a map of, of the oceans in the world, you see that all this red means very young, you know, from zero to a few million years. So when you go to the middle of the Atlantic Ocean or any other oceanic ridges, what you see there, the, the the rocks that you see there are very young, and as they spread towards the continents, they become older and older. But the <coughs> oceans, in general, are actually pretty young, because once they've reached the continent, they go underneath. And most oceans, you can see, they're only about 120, 150 million years. But we have actually many rocks in the continents that could be even a billion years old. Okay? There's only one ocean that is really, really old, and it's the Mediterranean. 
the Mediterranean has a lot of old material deposited there from the old tetis uh, that you probably all have heard of. And the oldest oceanic rocks are about 280 million years, while many, as I said, many of the other um, rocks and continents, they can be Cambrian, Precambrian, things like that. So once we start understanding that, what I'm interested in is the organisms that live there. And I look for really old animals, animals that could be 400 million years old, 300 million years old. And what I want to do is to trace them back. You know, if you go now back in time to, uh, you know, about 140 million years when the continents look completely different and Africa and South America were still together and together with Antarctica and Antarctica wasn't frozen and you had an entire fauna that lived all over these southern continents. This is the famous Gondwana, you had dinosaurs in Antarctica and you had a lot of faunas that nowadays are found typically in southern South America, obviously not in Antarctica because it froze after the opening of the Great Passage but many things you find in southern South America, southern Africa, Madagascar, India. This is now under water, that's the Kerwellen Plateau, but then Australia, New Zealand. Okay, so one of the things that we do is go to all these land masses and look for animals that live there and then bring them back into the lab and trying to study their evolution and see how whether we can trace the history of how these land masses broke up by looking at the organisms that live over there. And you can come up with maps or trees like that that tells you that you know Australia and Guinea were connected until about 30 million years okay? or that for example uh, South America where South America uh, separated from Australia and Guinea about 52 million years ago and it separated from New Zealand about 80 million years ago and, and once we have some of these points we can start looking at what happened with the fauna. Is the fauna of New Guinea more closely related to the Australian one than it is to the one in South America, etc. To do that, I use typically well, different groups of organisms. So one of my favorite ones are these things called daddy long legs in English or harvest men. Uh, the scientific name is opiliones. In Spanish, we call them opiliones. And they're very interesting because we have fossils that are about 410 million years old. So the group is really old. Uh, a lot of its diversity originated pretty early. And from the Opiliones, I've been working mostly on a group called Cyphophthalmi. And you have a few individuals on the ventral view there. They all look pretty similar. But when we go to all these places, we find that they have very conserved biogeographic patterns. So for example, these are all specimens from Southeast Asia. You know, Southeast Asia, just the colonized Southeast Asia at one time, one point in time, and then you know they diverge there. Or we have another group that is found in West Africa and Southern South America because they were connected only about a hundred million years or something like that. Then we have another group, this one in New Caledonia, which is pretty difficult for us to explain biogeographically the origin of New Caledonia, especially because it was probably submerged about 52 million years ago also and then re-emerged. So it's a bit more complicated. But then we have a typical group, a whole Arctic group from the Northern Hemispheres found in, in Europe, uh, North America, and Asia. And then this other group, which is the one that we've been putting most emphasis, this family of Italide, that is found, as I showed you earlier, in Chile, in South Africa, Sri Lanka, Australia, New Zealand, and Madagascar. So the group is perfect for doing these types of studies, and with that, we can actually try to trace back how those land masses broke up. And you know, I'm not gonna pay much more attention to that, but just show you that you can you know, go back in time to about 65 million years ago and see that, yeah, this group that is now found in Africa and South America, I mean, 65 million years ago, it was connected. So if the group is old enough, you can explain these patterns that we find nowadays by, by a process that we call vicariance, which is the animals stay there, they don't move around much, it's just as the continents separate, they end up having these disjunct distributions. And if you go even farther in time, as I showed earlier, all these things that are in New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, Madagascar, uh, Chile, well, you know, they were connected. They had probably a much broader distribution. They were for sure found in Antarctica. Uh, you know, it's hard to demonstrate because you can't go to Antarctica and find fossils from, you know, below kilometers of ice sometimes, but, but we see that these distributions make a lot of sense. 
once we explain the age of the organisms and go back in time and look at the configurations of the continents. And if you keep going back, same thing for you know when Europe and North America form part of this larger or the northern portion of this supercontinent called Pangaea. Okay. So this is some of the things that we're trying to do, uh, and we're looking at you know we have to go to all these places. You know sometimes they're uh, not very convenient and find some of these animals by mostly the animals that we look at they live in the leaf litter and the reason for that is that this is a very stable environment these animals normally don't disperse well they need to be in high humidity in undisturbed forests so we go to these places we use these sifters you know put a bunch of leaf litter there and get a lot of the tiny creatures that live in those places which are the ones that then we bring to the lab to do some of these um, these studies and we look at other animals also. Uh, in, on top there we have a couple resimulates, which is another group of arachnids, very interesting. Uh, nowadays they're only found in, in the neotropical region and in the West African uh, region, but in the past they were also found in Southeast Asia, so they probably, they probably had a much broader distribution and they went extinct at uh, the time. We look at things like centipedes and other weird arachnid groups like these ones called schizomids and these are things that i like to collect they're all small they all live in the leaf litter they all have these narrow ecological requirements that allow them to or don't allow them to disperse very well we look at other things also uh, but mostly a lot of the leaf litter animals and one of my favorite leaf litter animals that we've been working on lately are these things called velvet worms or onychophorans uh, a really cool ancient group we have fossils from 310 million years all that they look exactly like these guys uh, the distribution nowadays is a bit restricted to the south you know tropics and then southern continents mostly uh, but there once were also much broadly uh, much uh, distributed much more broadly because they were also in the northern hemisphere there's fossils from france for example uh, and we've been doing the same type of work uh, when we look at the phylogeny, the relationships between the individuals that we collect, we find that we have a tropical family that was found in, or it's found, sorry, in, in the neotropics, West Africa, and also Southeast Asia, which is the same distribution that those other resinolates had, for example, 100 million years ago. And the other group has the same distribution as the leftmost cyphophthalmic clade that I showed you. They're found in Chile, they're found in South Africa, in Australia, New Zealand, and also in New Guinea, for example. And when we look at the resolution of these things, we see biogeographical patterns that are very common. For example, finding Tasmania and New Zealand being related. You know, Tasmania is this little island here in New Zealand. They have a lot of shared fauna between these two parts. So we do, we're able to, tra to trace back a lot of these relationships by looking at the animals that live in those land masses and, and we hope to be adding more and more species to these types of um, analysis. We also do other type of work, very different. This is easy field work. You go you know, to different parts of the world or you rent a car or hire someone to drive you around and small teams. But some of the work requires a lot of logistics and, and large uh, vessels like this expedition. We took one, the largest uh, oceanographic uh, vessel from the Spanish government, the Sarmiento de Gamboa. And we went to this expedition in 2009 uh, to look at the Banco de Galicia, which is uh, an area that reaches down to about 5,000 meters. It's a very, it's a banco because it's a fisherman's area. That's where they get a lot of the fisheries in Galicia. And it's located about, you know, eight hours navigating west of um, Vigo. And there were several uh, things that they wanted to do there. One of them, they wanted to find the geologies whether there was granite in the bank of the earth. The reason for that is that they found granite over there. They could claim that that is part of the continental shelf and that therefore it belongs to Spain. You know, uh, if they don't find granite, it means no, it's part of the common ocean. You cannot claim fishing rights and all that. So one of the intentions of the geologists was to find granite. These expeditions are very different from the other ones, you know, very expensive vessels, large teams of people doing all different types of work, and also, you know, 
hiring a boat like that costs a lot of money. Somebody pays for it, I don't know who, but somebody pays many thousands and thousands of dollars. So you work 24 hours. So what you do, divide the crew in shifts, and you work in shifts of six hours, uh, quite eight hours, and then you work eight hours, you rest eight hours, you rest eight hours, you work eight hours again, no, six, sorry, because you do one and a half shift every day. Uh, some nights you don't sleep, some mornings you, you're working, it, it has much more obviously safety things. We have to test, uh, you know, the, the suits in case the, the boat sinks, and you know, there's a director. This is our team, uh, and this team was composed by people from Universidad de Vigo, Universidad de Santiago, uh, from a museum in, in Munich, and then for, for myself from here, from Harvard. Uh, and there were people from other international people in other, in other um, shifts. And this is the maximum depth that we went. So this is very interesting because working at these depths, you know, has a lot of logistics that, you know, think, yeah, just five kilometers down the surface of the ocean, you know, what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is that when you send something down there, you know, you might take four hours to send your dredge. You don't know if it touched bottom or not because you have tons, tons, like real tons, thousands of kilos of wire, you know, which is like moving with underwater currents. You wait like two hours thinking that you might be catching something and then it takes six hours to bring it back up and maybe it's empty, maybe you've lost the gear. So it has a lot of logistic problems. And we're doing, you know, testing different techniques, different dredges to collect. This is one uh, special, um, dredge that is trying to collect only the animals that live on the surface of the bottom. So when this touches the bottom, it disturbs them and then they come here in this fine mesh and you collect animals that, you know, they're not inside, but they're just like swimming around on the surface. And we're testing many different things like a lot of the phytologists or the uh, geologists wanted samples of water. So you can take these nesting models at different depths and open them there and you collect water from 5,000 meters or 2,000 meters and things like that. And also the animals or the plants or algae that live at those uh, depths. This is the, the dredge that the geologists really wanted to test. is La Draga de Roca, you know, the rock dredge. It's just, it's just a huge dredge. It just breaks anything that it touches. Either breaks the rock or, or you just lost it, lose everything. You know, it's either one. It's, it's pretty uh, heavy and the idea is that you, know, that you bring pieces of rock here and then you can examine what types of rocks you have in the bottom of the ocean. Um, and there's other things, you know, the logistics here, for example, is a, a device that we send down the water, a very expensive dredge that was designed for this expedition. This is made of like really thick inox, but the designer forgot to drill little holes in along here and obviously when you bring something that has air to 5,000 meters depth just just collapses it like if it was paper you know you can see what happens to a normal you know a styrofoam cap when you put it at those pressures you know it just compresses so this is very typical that people send a, you know a few of these things down with drawings and all that and then you get these super compact uh middle glass you can see here this was the original diameter of these stainless steel, really thick, and it just came like flat, completely flat. Um, so that one we couldn't work anymore. And then you're working many hours, ships in the boat, uh, sometimes rocking really badly, like the last two days we had very bad storms and you're trying to get you know, the dredges to work, the animals, uh, photograph, fix, prepare for the analysis, and then bring them to the lab. But you get things that are you know, pretty cute, others are pretty obscene looking animals. <laughs> All sorts of things that live in the, in the bottom of the ocean. Um, and these are some pinagonids. So it's really interesting fauna. Um, and the idea is to go there to collect things that obviously will not be accessible uh, with other types of expeditions. So deep sea expeditions require a lot of logistics, but you get animals that, that are very difficult to obtain otherwise. And what we do with a lot of these things is a lot of DNA work. In fact, we do a lot of genomics or transcriptomics in the lab. Some of the lab members are here, they know much more about uh, the transcriptomics than I do. But the idea is to bring these things and try to get as much genetic information as possible to draw these evolutionary trees to look at the biogeographic questions or look at the evolutionary questions. So, and, and 
you know, I think that you all know a little bit about DNA and the importance that in 1953 they discovered, you know, they published that seminal paper by Watson and Crick where they decipher the uh, secondary structure of the double helix, uh, the tertiary structure of the double helix. Um, it took a long time until people could really do much stuff with DNA. I mean, they knew the structure, but you couldn't do much with it. Uh, but in 1977, uh, Frederick Sanger invented the method that we still use, many people still use, to actually read the DNA code, which is a method for what we call sequencing DNA. Uh, and this method, he developed some enzymatic reactions to stop uh, replication of DNA and be able to read it. And then a few years later, people started using this thing, uh, reading the DNA sequences, to compare DNA sequences between different animals to start coming up with the first trees of uh, animals. Okay, and we use now DNA routinely to uh, give, you know, this is the, the original paper, obviously that original phylogeny was based on very little data from a single gene, and the relationships are not what we think nowadays, but, uh, but that was, you know, the seminal first paper where they actual, actually used DNA sequencing for looking at evolutionary trees. And from then things went really quickly now. From 1988, the first animal phylogeny. In 1996, you have the first eukaryotic genome for uh, fungi, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Uh, two years later, the first animal genome was published, only in 1998, using cyber sequencing, brute force type of thing, you know, hundreds of labs, sequencing, sequencing, sequencing. Uh, in 2000, you had the first Drosophila, the biggest model organism, also the, bear, the biggest plant model, the first plant genome for Arabidopsis. Next year, it's the sequencing of the human genome. And there were the two competing papers, uh, the one in science from the, uh, the consortium that had hundreds of labs all over the world sequencing a lot of these things, and then Craig Venter came a couple of years later and said, oh, I'm gonna do that on my own with my own company, and he actually, in two, three years, was able to sequence the human genome, and that one was published in Science. So they, they had one in Science, one in Nature, each one. Uh, but things started changing a lot. You know, there were now these massive places to do sequencing, still using old technology, but brute force, lots of machines. Uh, but what we had seen until then, until 2007, more or less, is that Sequencing still follow this Moore's law, which the bioinformaticians or the computational people know what it is. You know, you basically are able to duplicate the number of transistors of one uh, motherboard every two years. You know? So it's not a very sustainable way of, of sequencing. The first genomes cost about $100 million. You know, by 2007, were about $10 million per genome. Obviously, the low the lowly uh, zoologists like me couldn't even think of sequencing that, and that's why we only had a few genomes from a few model organisms where there were a lot of research resources um, invested in. And we had the mouse, and we had humans, and, and a few Drosophila, C. elegans, and a few other things. What happened after 2007, it's key for a lot of the research that we do nowadays, and is the development of new technologies for sequencing completely changing the paradigm of these Sanger sequencing and people started using other machines and here you know just showing like the Illumina machine which is one that we uh, routinely use in the lab where you're actually able to sequence hundreds of millions of uh, sequences for just a few thousand dollars okay? and this is now we're talking about possibility of using these technologies to sequence entire genomes for a few thousand dollars instead of talking about millions and this is what we've seen since 2007. Then sequencing capacity, you know, price per base just went down. And we're now, you know, at a limit of, you know, you could do a sequence, uh, an entire genome for about $5,000. And these prices keep going down. I mean, in fact, the goal is that within the next couple of years, people are thinking about sequencing entire genomes for $100 to $1,000. And once we're able to do that, we can you know, do anything that we want in evolutionary biology. There's no model organisms anymore. We can do, we use anything that we want. So where is this technology taking us? And this is the last five minutes of the talk. Uh, they told me about 30 to 40 minutes. 
So um, this is obviously for us, is putting us in a great position. You know, before, we could only access to these model organism genomes and then use those to compare to our organisms, but really not be able to do the same type of work. Um, now you can do, you know, a couple of years ago, or last year, no, 2010 already, yeah. So they, they discover uh, in Siberia these two, a couple of bones, like fingertip bones, and teeth from a hominid that they didn't even know what it was. You know, they had no idea how it looked. They knew it was hominid bones and they were able to sequence from this fossil a bone an entire genome. So this is how you can, you know, where you can get nowadays with some of these technologies. And this again didn't require millions of dollars. This was only thousands of dollars. Highly fragmented DNA from an, an, an hominid that they discovered is an entire new lineage. It's not homo sapiens. <coughs> it's not Homo neanderthalensis. You know? so, so you can get there. And obviously, now there's large consortia of people who are there. For example, the I5K, this is a community of insect people who are trying to sequence about 5,000 genomes of insects. Uh, they haven't sequenced the 5,000 genomes, we must say, but very recently they published a beautiful paper in science where they had transcriptomes and genomes for a large number of insects and are able to provide very complete pictures of the evolution of these very large groups of organisms. And there's many other initiatives with plants and with uh, nematodes and we have our own that is called GAIGA which is the uh, Global Invertebrate Genomics Alliance and, and this is trying to bring community resources and, and expertise from different people to actually contribute towards the genomics, uh, not necessarily genomes, but also transcriptomes of as many invertebrates as possible. And these initiatives are beginning, they don't have a lot of funding, but now the funding is coming from a lot of the, the private labs. So what we use this data for is to infer the tree of life. And I'm not gonna show you many trees, but I just wanna give you an example of what we can do with that. And this is something, some of the research that I was involved with a couple of years ago, where we uh, actually found that a group of animals called tinophores were actually found to be the most basal animals, more basal than sponges. And sponges were thought to be basal because they don't have a nervous system, they don't have any tissues structure in the typical way that we know in other animals, but tinophores do have those things. Uh, we did this phylogenetic analysis using large amounts of data, tiny compared to what we use nowadays, um, but anyhow, I can point there. But the idea is that we found that the tinophores are at the base, so more basal than porifera, and the alternative option is whether the sponges are at the base. This is a debate that's still going on in the, in the literature, in the community. We're trying to generate more resources to answer questions like this. Are tinophores the most basal uh, animals? therefore implying that all animals originally had a nervous system and a tissue uh, organization and then it was lost in some lineages like sponges and other lineages like placozoans or were simple animals without tissues and without nervous systems first and then complexity evolved later on. So we're also trying to answer other similar questions like for example uh, what is the base of the bilateral animals? The animals that have bilateral symmetry like we do. There's some basal animals that don't look like us. They're not cephalized. They don't have bilateral symmetry. They might have radial symmetry. They might, have, they might be asymmetric like many sponges. So there's an idea that at the beginning, at the origin of these uh, bilateral symmetries, there were some animals that are called acils or shenotur bellets that don't have a, a through gut. The, the gut is not well developed. They don't have a brain like ours. They do have some concentration of neurons in the anterior part of the body, completely disconnected from the mouth. We always associate cephalization with two functions. One is sensorial and the other one is, is fitting. But many of these things, imagine an animal that has actually some brain in, in the anterior part of the body and the mouth located you know, in the posterior part of the body, completely separated. So there's also some debate about the origin of the bilateral animals and how that evolved. And one of them is whether these basal animals go early in the bilateral tree or they're actually more closely related as very simplified, secondarily simplified animals that they're related to things like us, you know, the deer stuff, things like sea urchins and, and uh, vertebrates and things like that. So those are the types of questions we're trying to answer 
For a long time, we've been limited in the amount of data we could throw at these questions. We had only a few genes that we sequenced via Sanger sequencing, or the first technologies for, for generating some of these larger data sets. And what we're doing nowadays is actually trying to sequence entire genomes or very complete transcriptomes uh, for many animals also to try to address some of those questions. And then we come up with you know, trees that look like that. Um, this is uh, some of the, the, la the last complete, more or less complete animal phylogeny, which we published you know, many years ago, now in 2009. No one has really looked at this with all the new technologies. This was used still with that technology that I showed you up to 2007. And what this generated, I'm going to skip that, are matrices that are fairly incomplete. This is our 2009 matrix when we're looking at about uh, 1,500 genes for all animals. And you can see that on top you have some animals from which we have genomes like Drosophila, C. elegans, or humans, but we had a lot of genes, a lot of black. But many of the other ones, they had very sparse sampling, just a few genes sequenced here and there. Uh, nowadays, you know, we can generate matrices of the same size. This is a matrix we're analyzing for worms, for annelids, has the same number of genes, about 1,473, uh, but you see that here most of that graph is black. So this is the change in technology has allowed us now to be able to generate the amounts of data that we had in 2009 only for model organisms, but now we can do it for pretty much everything. Obviously, this poses a lot of analytical challenges. Uh, all the resources, a lot of resources in the lab are now spent just in the computers and fighting who's going to get all the CPUs this month. Uh, and, and Rosa is running out of karma all the time. Karma is the way they used to measure how much work you've been doing in the common cluster, and she burns it all the time because they're all, you know, we're always doing these types of analysis. The idea is to come up with complete trees. This is one tree that uh, we're getting ready for publication, where we're including the first transcriptomes of really small animals, animals that are 125 microns in size, for which we only have like one or two genes, and now we have these very large amounts of data. We can really evaluate the position of, of enigmatic animals like these other two here, Diodrillus or Lobatus cerebrum. These are two, an two animals that no one knew what they are. They're always called problematica. People didn't know whether they were related to annelids or to flatworms or other things. And with these amounts of data now, we have pretty strong results suggesting that these very enigmatic animals actually come with annelids. Uh, so this is the, the types of things that we're trying to do with this data. Uh, when we're trying to look at the tree of life, the earlier data, when we're trying to see how continents move and the fauna that live there, it's more of the biogeographical work, but it is a lot of fun. Uh, it's great because you have to interact with people with expertise in many different areas, from the animals, to the field, to the computers, uh, gen genomics, and, and that's really good. So with that, I just want to conclude by thanking uh, the lab. And this is a photo taken from the lab uh, outside of our building. Uh, some of the funding sources, especially uh, the ATOL Assembly, the Tree of Life program from the National Science Foundation, uh, and also from some of my collaborators that have been uh, instrumental in some of the work that we've been doing in these aspects through the years. Mm -hmm.